Good morning, church. Our scripture reading today is from 2 Corinthians. I'll be starting in chapter 1, verse 3. Uh, 2 Corinthians, chapter 1, verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. For just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm, because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. Good morning, church. We missed you guys, and it's good to be back. I hope you had a great holiday. Um, we did. Uh, we were able to watch uh, our youngest son graduate from college. Uh, you probably can't see, but he's smiling. He didn't graduate cum laude, but thank you, Alada. And uh, and I'm, I'm Julie and I are really happy that he. He graduated, thank you a lot, of, you know, and um, it, was a, it was a great graduation. Uh, uh, the commencement speaker is a senator from Arkansas. He's also a graduate of Harding University, and um, I want to talk to you, uh, just, just put in a plug about Christian education. Um, it is very, very important. It, you will do a great service to your children if you can get them to a Christian college. And uh, I, I've seen the difference it's made in my son's life over the last four and a half years. And, and uh, it's helped him to be a stronger man, I believe. And uh, so um, I know it's not the cheapest education that you can send your child to, but it's a very worthwhile education. And so Harding University is a very good one. We have David Lipscomb and Tori is going to be going there. And uh, we've had go uh, some of our kids go to Pepperdine and, and some of our Christian universities. Um, if you look at U.S. News and World Report, our Christian universities are doing a very good job. That our, our universities and the Churches of Christ uh, are doing a good job educating our children. And so um, I'm glad that Jeremy went to Harding. I'm glad, I'm especially happy he graduated. And, uh, and so uh, keep that in mind as you think about your own kids. But it was also, uh, uh, you know, a little difficult for us going to watch Julie's parents and where they're at. Uh, Julie's dad's 80, um, her mom's 79. Um, Julie and I took her dad for a walk and it's his house and we only walk for a block and we come back and he looked at me and he said is this your house I said no Floyd it's your house because he has Alzheimer's and so he's in and out he 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 knows things for a moment and then he'll quickly forget so a, a survey was done by Barna Research, and people were saying, uh, the question was, if you could ask God one question, what would it be? And the number one question is, why is there so much pain and suffering? Why, why do we live in a world where there's so much pain and suffering? Um, and how do you reconcile that with a God that's all-powerful and all-loving? It's a good question to ask. Why are there natural catastrophes? Why are there massacres where people are being gunned down? Why are there so many floods like going on right now at the Mississippi River and people losing their homes? Why do I have to be a, at an airport when a tornado comes by? <laughs> uh, and that was, that's what happened to us last weekend. We were at Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. We want to come back to Connecticut and there was tornadoes sweeping through Dallas. 
you guys have probably heard this in the news, 11 people died in Dallas, Texas last weekend. And um, thousands of us were affected by it, especially those at the airport. It took us 40 hours to get home. And so why is there so much pain and suffering in this world? Let's get a little more personal. Maybe you wanted to have a child but could not have a child, even though you wanted to have a child. There are people in this room who have had a child, and then the child was born with some difficulty. Some of you in this room have had children who have passed on before you. And you can look up and say, that's the wrong order of things. How is it possible that I'd lose my child before I die? But we live in a world like that. We live in a world where our kids could have disabilities, where we could outlive our children. Maybe you are sitting here and you say, boy, I reached out to love somebody, but love wasn't returned. And you're living with that emptiness of, of, of being unloved by someone. And then you could talk about betrayal. You could talk about abandonment. You could talk about physical abuse, sexual abuse, mental abuse. Some of you in this room can feel these things. And you cry out, why? Why does it have to happen? And I know some of you dealing with pain and anguish where it's difficult to put one foot in front of another because of what's happened. I don't have all the answers. This sermon will not clear up all the questions. But I hope, I hope that there's some principles here that can help. You know, skeptics of Christianity seize on this very point and they try to discredit God. They try to say, why are you guys here this morning? Why serve a God that allows all this pain and suffering? And through the years, people have come up with a couple approaches to this. Some will say, well, God is, is powerful, but he's not all powerful. Um, there's a, a, a writer by the name of Kirshner, Harold Kirshner, wrote a book, Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? And the reason he was motivated to write this book, he had a child who had this terrible degenerative disease that would cause his child to age unusually. His child only made it until his teen years and passed away. And he wrote this book after that. And basically this rabbi said, well, God is powerful, but he's not all powerful. There's some things that God cannot do. That was his conclusion. Even though he wants to do it, he, he's not capable of changing things. And so that was his conclusion. But Genesis chapter 1 talks about this day, this day, this day, and God created this and God created that. He's all powerful. He's able to create things. So how do you justify him not being able to do things? That's a problem. That if God is all powerful, why do these terrible things happen? Others think, well, God is all powerful, but he's created this world, but now he's kind of stepped back and he's uninvolved. It's called deism. Um, some of our Thomas Jefferson was a deist. He felt, felt that God created things, but now he's just kind of let things run and without his involvement. I, I, I struggle with that. Matthew chapter 10 verse 30 says that God counts every hair on, on your head. He doesn't spend a whole lot of time on mine. But, but the Bible says in Matthew 10 and verse 30 that God has numbered the hairs on your head. Another thing is that 1 John 4 says, we love because he first loved us. That the God that you and I worship today is a loving God. And this whole concept of love comes from him. So, how do you answer this question? Job's wife, you know, Job was afflicted from head to toe with sores. And what did his wife say? Curse God and die. Well, that's not a whole lot of encouragement from your spouse. Right? Not only is he sick, but he's got a wife that seems to, doesn't really care much about him. Right? <laughs> Curse God and die, Job. It's like, hey, what, what's the use of having the person? He's not helping you. 
And some of you may be going through that. And so I, I want to share some things that maybe will make some sense. Um, sometimes suffering is because of our own sinful choices. I mean, if you drink like a fish, I'm talking about alcohol. If you drink like a fish, don't be surprised if it affects your liver and other things that it can do. That if you drink like a fish, there's consequent. Don't be surprised if you run into a telephone pole. Well, how did that, God, why did that happen? You were drunk. All right. So sometimes suffering occurs because of our sinful choices. If you eat like a pig, all right, and you get heart disease, don't blame God, right? You're the one eating McDonald's French fries and quarter pounders, and you made some choices to eat like a pig. If you got the morals of a tomcat, don't be surprised if you get a sexually transmitted disease. That some of the suffering in this world is because I've made bad choices and you've made bad choices. And they're suffering because of that. Paul will say, a man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. And so he's saying, you, you, if you sow that seed, there's going to be consequences because you sowed that seed. But I have an owner's manual. Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth, B-I-B-L-E, right? And if I follow this, it's a pretty good code of ethics. And there's a book out called None of These Diseases written by a, a medical doctor, and he was, he's amazed. And if you follow this, it has some good implications. But if I rebel against this, then there's consequences. That explains some, some of it. Another thing is that suffering is due to the choices of other people. That sometimes we suffer because of other people's mistakes. And some of you have that. You, you grew up where there's mental, sexual, physical abuse. And they say that a, a large number of women have dealt with this. Some men have dealt with this. And you're here and somebody hurts you that should have loved you. And sometimes you're suffering because of their sin, not yours. They were the sinners and you were suffering. The Bible talks about this in Genesis chapter 4. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. The Bible says Abel was a good man. But his brother was jealous and he killed him. So Abel suffered because of his brother's sin. Sometimes that's true. I had a good friend. Uh, I became a Christian. He didn't. He got drunk, had three people in the car, and he wrecked the car and killed himself and three other people. It was his sin that affected others, you see. And so sometimes that happens. What happened in Sandy Hook three years ago? You know, a 20-year-old man who's deranged, who's not stable, and he killed 26 people right here in our neighborhood. That sometimes pain and suffering is because of other people's mistakes. The Bible goes on to say sometimes it's because simply because of the devil. And Jesus will say this in John 10. It's talking about the devil. It says the devil came... To steal, kill, and destroy. And then in the case of Job, it says, So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job. So some suffering comes directly from the devil. That he's involved. But, you know, we can carry this too far. You could sneeze and you may say, Get behind me, demon of sinuses. You know? I don't think really the demons behind your sneeze, necessarily. I think you live in Connecticut, Sinus Valley. And, and we, we have all of these different trees here and pollen and all this stuff. And it may not necessarily be a demon. So I'm not saying just because you're suffering, the devil's there. You get it? Some suffering is for other reasons. And so, but the devil can be involved in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul has a thorn in the flesh and he calls it a messenger of Satan in 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 7. 
Some suffering is because of natural laws of a fallen world. If you have a very nice house and build it on the shoreline of Florida, a hurricane may come and blow the roof off. If you live in California, you might experience an earthquake. But we still build homes in Florida and California, right? That we build homes on fault lines and, and where the earth shifts. And sometimes we suffer because of just natural calamities. Hurricanes, tornadoes fit into that category. They can be explained through nature. Um, water is a wonderful thing. You have to have it to live, but water can also drown you. Gravity is a wonderful thing, but if I'm out there hanging Christmas lights on the house and I fall off, gravity can hurt me. Some, some of you might be allergic to a bee sting. That a bee sting will send you to the hospital. If you're not treated, you, you, you could die. But you know, that bee has that stinger to protect his honey. It's God's law. That bees use that to protect their honey. If there's no honey, there's no bees. If there's no bees, there's no pollination. You see the idea? God has some natural laws, and some of these natural, like a bee sting, I don't like them, but there's something about that that's deeper than the bee sting. You get what I'm saying? Um, gravity is a good thing. Imagine living in a world where there's no sustainable law that you could count on gravity one day but not count on it another. That, you couldn't trust anything, right? That God has these laws, in fact, that uh, in, intact to help us. However, the Bible does say, after the Garden of Eden, that this earth now is cursed. And the laws of nature and the earth is groaning. Look at what Paul says in Romans 8. For the creation was subjected, notice this, to frustration. Not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in pains of childbirth right up to the present time. That's not just us. I think this world is groaning. And the, the natural laws and all the calamities are part of what happened as a consequence of us not listening to God. And he punished us. Jesus will say this, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, what will you have? Trouble. As you live here, you're going to have trouble. It's not going to be just peace and joy and all the good stuff. You're going to have trouble in this world. But I like the way he ends. But take heart, I've overcome the world. I don't know about you, but that's why I'm here worshiping today. Amen. People will say, well, where is God? He was there when Jesus was nailed to the cross, people. All right? He was right there when Jesus died. And he had a solution to the pain and suffering of this world. He had a solution to our bodies dying by giving his son the ability to come back again. So people will say, well, God's not powerful enough or he doesn't care. I think there's a third option. And that is sometimes good can come out of suffering. That God can use it. You know the text. Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. You know, sometimes we have two rows of people sit right up front here, the Bellamere's. You guys know the story, right? It all st started with Sandy Stevens' funeral. That, that opened the eyes to Art Sr., and we got to study with him, and it led to the conversion of his family. That God can use pain and suffering and bring about good. We've seen it here more than once. Another thing, God uses it to discipline us. Uh, you came, to, came here to hear that, right? 
that God can use pain and toil to discipline us. In the book of Hebrews, it says, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone who accepts as his son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as children for what children are not disciplined by their father. Oh my, when I think of Jeremy, he was a year old when we started working here. And all the pain, all the spankings, all the Jeremy, I remember some of you saying, I nearly killed him in the parking lot. <laughs> but he's turned out all right, and the other one as well. All right? But don't think there wasn't some discipline that went along the way. All right? Jeremy got, Jeremy got disciplined a whole bunch more than his adopted brother. All right? All right? And I spanked both of them, but the biological child got it more. All right? He needed it. All right? That parents have to discipline. You love your child and you want to guide your child and train your child. And God wants to do that to everybody sitting here. Every one of you. He doesn't want to just save you. He wants you to grow up. He wants you to get strong. To rely on him. And he'll allow some bumps in the road to cause you to look up to him. But don't think everything that happens to you is God's discipline either. There's verses, like in John chapter 9, a man was born blind and it says, Who sinned, this man or his parents? What was Jesus' answer? Neither one of them. So some people are born blind and it's not because of their sin. It's not because of their parents' sin. John chapter 9 tells you that. In Luke chapter 13, it says that a, a tower fell down and killed some people. And Jesus said it wasn't because of their sin that that happened to them. So just because there's hardship and there's pain and suffering, don't think God is doing that directly to you. You get it? Right? I know that's not a clear answer, but it's a Bible answer. I, I, I understand this from Scripture. But sometimes God does use pain and suffering to discipline us. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness, peace for those who have been trained by it. So sometimes pain and suffering can help us. It could be, it's a hard school. School of hard knocks is a hard school. But it can help us in the long run. Paul will even acknowledge this in his own life. He's got this thorn in the flesh. He asked God three times to remove it. But he said to me, this is God speaking, communicating to Paul, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Now, that's a bummer. I mean, he's praying for God to deliver him from this pain, and God says, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. And some of you have been there, and you've gone through it, and you've agonized to God in prayer, and God didn't give you an affirmative answer of relieving you from the discomfort. Augustine said this about Peter, For Peter was in a healthier condition when he wept and was dissatisfied with himself than when he boldly presumed and satisfied himself. Remember the story? That Peter says, I'll never deny you. And he did that night. And Augustine said it was whenever he wept that God was able to use the man. When he was broken, that God could use him. Another point, God can use your pain and suffering to benefit others. That's the text that was read to you out of 2 Corinthians. I underlined a verse there. 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 4 says, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. So the Bible says that God comforts us so that you and I can learn to comfort other people. I told Julie that her mother was a great example to people. Uh, Floyd is at a point where he just follows his wife around in the house like a little child. 
So Julie's mother will go into the kitchen and, and Julie's dad will just go there and stand by her. After a while, that would grind on you, right? I love my wife, but I don't want her to follow me all over the house, you know? But that's Julie's mother. As she goes through the house, her 80-year-old husband just follows her around, you know? She has to help him sit in a chair. She has to help him change himself. I saw her reach out and touch him. I hope she will, you know. I said, she's a great example for you. We were at worship two weeks ago. Uh, Floyd used to be a preacher. He can't even read the words anymore. Jason was sitting by his grandfather, and his grandfather could sing. I still remember the song. I'm sorry. Stephen Brown said, for every believer, unbeliever that gets cancer, I believe there is a believer that gets cancer so that the world can see the difference. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Okay. My, my boys were able to see their grandparents. <laughs> and it's a good memory. This woman, <clears throat> when she was 17 years old and Chesapeake Bay, dove down into some shallow water and it broke her neck. Joni um, Erickson Tata is her name. For three and a half decades, she's lived in this chair, much like our Teresa Hunt and others here. Um, a lot of people, a lot of things like that would cause a person to be, make them bitter. But this woman travels all over the United States doing seminars on pain and suffering. And I was watching a video clip, <clears throat> and she was being interviewed by a preacher. And she says that she hopes that whenever she goes to heaven, she's able to take her wheelchair with her. And, and it was, it's a, this Cadillac version, this one kind of looks like the one Teresa drives which is heavy. I think him. You can try to push that thing. All right. She says it's the old one that she has, the one that she had years ago, and it was all beat up and bent and all of that. She says, I want to take that one to heaven. Whenever I go to heaven, I want to take my wheelchair with me. And I want to be able to look at that and say, God, thank you for my new glorified body. This is Joni saying this. And thank you for the lessons I've learned because of this wheelchair. And then she said, now send it to hell. And that leads me to another point about suffering. God can, God can take you to a deeper place in faith through suffering. And, and it, it can cause us to, to hold on him deeper than we've ever had before. In fact, Psalm 119 says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey your word. So hardship can, can either turn us into clay or butter. So if you're going through hard times, allow it to turn you into butter and not make you bitter. Here's another thing I learned from Scripture. When I suffer, I'm not alone, and you're not alone. In Psalm 34, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed, crushed in spirit. So God, God knows that you're hurting, and He's there. Here's a great text in Romans 8. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know 
what we ought to pray for. But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And He searches our heart and knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Have you ever been in a point where you don't know what to pray? The Bible says... you listen to Tony's scripture reading. <clears throat> Thank you for the cup of water. Sometimes I don't know what to pray. You ever had that problem? And it says the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. Isn't that great? All right. That somehow there's some communication going on in that unseen world that we're not even aware of. And so again, what is that saying to you? God is there. And He identifies with you. Another thing I get from Scripture, your pain is not wasted. In fact, sometimes it, we need it. We need it to come to our senses. Paul will say in 2 Corinthians 7, this is from the message, distress that drives us to God does that. It turns us around. It gets us back in the way of salvation. We never forget that kind of pain. But those who let distress drive them away from God are full of regrets and end up on a deathbed of regrets. So sometimes godly sorrow will bring us to repentance. And pain and suffering can awaken us to God and His presence. But praise God, folks, someday pain will be over. All right? And Paul will say in Romans 8, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. Someday when we're in heaven, we'll look back and say, ah, it wasn't so bad. All right? When Julie and I said our goodbyes to her family, her father we had this party and we exchanged these uh, dirty Santa. Every guy's ever here, dirty Santa. Where you have all these crazy gifts and, and you've got a gift and then somebody, some of your family will say, I want that gift and they come and take your gift. All right. It's dirty. All right. I was holding one of these headlamps. I always wanted one. And, and one, of Julie's, one of Julie's relatives came over and he says, can I see it? And I held on and went like that. And I said, go ahead, look at it. <laughs> I brought it home. <laughs> yeah. I'm dirty. Right? But Julie's dad was so out of it. He, he was just sitting in a chair and we've got pictures of that. It's very sad, you know. But our last goodbye, she bent over to her father. And said, I don't know if I'll see you again, but I'll see you in heaven. And he said, that's right. Yeah. Do you have that hope? Do you have that hope? He's got it. Julie has it. You need it. If you're not a Christian, you need to really consider Jesus. Let's stand and sing.